<laughs> Jim, were you tempted to jump in at all? Oh, hell yes. No, you guys did great. Uh, but I'm always, yeah, I'm always tempted to do that. But that's all right. I'm glad I didn't. It was great awesome. to sit back and listen. It was great. <laughs> it was great. So excellent, excellent work. Appreciate it very much. Welcome, everyone, to the July 2024 edition of The Impact, a sustainable CT podcast for your edification, your enlightenment, and your entertainment, too. My name is Jackie Flaherty, and I'm a sustainable CT fellow at the South Central Regional COG. And my name is Adrian Huck, and I'm a sustainable CT fellow at the Capital Region COG. And we are guest hosting the Impact Podcast for communications manager Jim Hunt this month, so you can still blame him for this podcast. But we're delighted to be here, and remember, this is never a one-way conversation. We always want to hear from you for our edification and enlightenment. Drop us a note, won't you? To info at sustainablect.org. The Impact is brought to you in part by a couple of great sponsors of the Sustainable CT Fellowship Program, the Hampshire Foundation and the Community Foundation for Greater New Haven. The Hampshire Foundation funds partners who are finding pathways to rapidly reduce greenhouse gas emissions or help people build resilience against poverty and climate change. And we are so glad they do. Visit them at hampshirefoundation.org. And the Community Foundation for Greater New Haven inspires, supports, informs, listens to, and collaborates with the people and organizations of Greater New Haven to build a more connected, inclusive, equitable, and philanthropic community. Visit them at cfgnh.org. The Sustainable CT Fellowship Program would not exist without the generous underwriting of organizations like these, so we are very grateful for their support and the work they do. Remember, Sustainable CT is independently funded. We don't have a magical rainbow money tree, but you can be a Sustainable CT sponsor. Please find out how at sustainablect.org. Today, we're excited to have three stellar guests who will help us explore sustainability work being done at Connecticut's public college campuses, Derek Faulkner, Amelia Kearney, and Dylan Steer. Derek Faulkner has been working for this Office of Sustainability at Southern Connecticut State University since 2019 when he started as a student worker. After graduating with a degree in environmental systems and sustainability, he remained at SCSU through a grant-funded fellowship and now as a university assistant with the Conscious Business Academy at the School of Business. During this time, Derek worked with the Menon Menoncatuck Audubon Society to create the East River Watershed Research Institute, which is leading a long-term collaborative research project focused on the East River Marsh and Harbor in Guilford. Through these two roles and ongoing volunteer work in Greater New Haven, Derek has worked on collaborative projects and events spanning topics like sustainability, conservation, food justice, recycling, waste, compost, urban agriculture, and green spaces. So welcome, Derek, and thank you for being here today. I'm excited to have another Greater New Havener in the mix. How are you? Excellent, excellent. Thanks for having me today. All right, and next up, we have Dylan Steer, who's a senior at the University of Connecticut, majoring in environmental studies and political science with a minor in Middle Eastern studies. He's an intern with the Yukon Office of Sustainability and president of EcoHusky, an environmental club on campus. He's also a lead organizer with Fossil Fuel for Yukon, an activism coalition working to decarbonize Yukon and divest the Yukon's investments in the fossil fuel industry. Also, Dylan is a fellow Sustainability CT fellow, currently working with the Western Connecticut COG in Sandy Hook. This is Dylan's second time around as a fellow, and he's a veteran of the impact too. Dylan, thanks so much for being here. I'm, I'm really glad you could join us today. How are you doing? Doing well. I'm really excited to be here. Thanks. All right. And last but not least, we have Amelia Curdy, a 20-year-old college student and climate activist from Burlington, Connecticut. She recently graduated from Tungsis Community College and is pursuing her bachelor's degree in biology and environmental science research. She has worked extensively with the nonprofit youth organization Sunrise Movement Connecticut, interned at the Connecticut General Assembly during the 2023 legislative session, and recently attended a sustainable engineering study abroad boot camp in Bidart, France. Very cool. She was also the founder and president of the Tungsis Sustainability Club. So bienvenue, Amelia. Welcome back from France and congrats on graduating. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. 
Thank you. And we're so excited you could be here despite camping. We appreciate your commitment. And thank you all for taking the time to chat with us today. And now that we've got all our introductions out of the way, we're excited to get to some questions. So I will pass it to Jackie. All right, you guys. So just to kick it off, we're going to, we're going to be, where did you, how did you guys originally get involved in environmental activism? Um, and what prompted you to plug into sustainability efforts at your own college? So, um, Derek, if you want to kick us off. Yeah, sure. Um, so originally I had my associate's degree, uh, in dietetic technology, which is nutrition, essentially dietary theory, and just saw benefits of plant-based diet. Uh, and I was vegan for a little bit and, you know, animal welfare topic, just naturally linked to environmental topic. And so I just kind of shifted my interest and wanted to go back to school and saw this degree, environment, geography, marine science uh, at Southern Connecticut State University. You know, State University was really affordable. It was close to where I was. So I went there and found the Geography, Environment, Marine Science Club while I was there. And so I got involved in that and then stumbled on the Office of Sustainability and got involved there. And then while I was there, I just found awesome overlap between a bunch of different organizations in New Haven and started volunteering. And yeah, that's where I am now. Awesome. Well, that's really exciting to hear. Um, I guess I'll go on to Dylan. Have, have Were your experiences similar? Were um, kind of like when you went to college, did you start getting into activism or was it before then? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say my journey definitely started in college. I mean, I was involved in activism prior to my experience in college. I uh, came in in 2021. So it was right after uh, Black Lives Matter movement, where that was the first time I really got involved in activism in my hometown. But environmental activism, I definitely started when I got to college. I was not originally into environmentalism or political science. I came into college undecided. I had no idea what I was going to do. And I was really lucky enough to get connected with some individuals who are involved in the environmental space and the community. And um, I saw that. And I just really felt connected there. I felt supported there. And I was like, wow, there's a lot of cool work going on right here. And I really want to get involved and uh, put my efforts to good use. And yeah, I, I've been really lucky with the people I've met. And yeah, I think UConn, a lot of work to be done, but I'm really proud of the work we've done so far. I'm sure we're going to get into that uh, later on. But but yeah, I, I think it was just the community there that that initially put me into this space. And Awesome. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think um, the the people are a big reason that environmental activism is such like a welcoming community. Um, and that's obviously why it's so great to talk to all of you today to get to know some more people in the state um, um, working towards the same goals. But um, yeah, Amelia, um, any other thoughts? Did you have um, similar experiences? Um, were you involved before college? Yeah, for me, um, it's something I kind of always grew up with because my mom is super into sustainability and environmentalism. Um, but definitely more like at the individual level. But like in high school, I took environmental science. And that's really when I started getting more involved, like in activism. And that's when I joined Sunrise Connecticut. So yeah, I wasn't originally like super into the political aspect of it until like mid high school. But now that's something that I'm super interested in and studying. All right, wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Um, we know that you are all part of different groups, whether it's in your university and also outside of that with external nonprofits or other organizations or even collaborations with other groups on your campus. So we're curious what kinds of cross-group collaborations have groups that you've been part of facilitated um, and how have you found collaborative efforts to be enriching at all to your groups? And also given that your colleges are in different areas of the state, how has your college's location facil facilitated any of those community collaborations? And Derek, since you mentioned some New Haven area organizations, would you want to kick it off for this one? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I think we're lucky in New Haven because there's so many, like our office and me personally have found plenty on campus and off campus groups, nonprofits, departments. So a couple, I guess, recent ones, just right off the top of my head, fun stuff, like getting some light resistant chestnuts from the American Chestnut Foundation and finding a spot on campus to plant a demonstration site. You could call it a demonstration orchard, but it's only like 10 trees right now. So it's not, not, not too large. Doing some, some work at Beaver Brook, which, you know, we have Beaver Pond right in the the backyard of Southern. So uh, finding groups to come join us in this cleanup and sort of trying to create a trail over there. Uh, Bioregional group, West River Watershed Coalition, Friends of Beaver Pond Park, uh, different faculty and 
interesting people at Southern that you wouldn't like history professors coming down there to help us just interesting stuff. How about also at the garden? I, I like finding faculty who are interested in doing research and, and somehow finding a way to connect it with what we're doing out there. So someone from earth sciences out there setting up moisture monitoring uh, for their own research. We have uh, Lee Whittinghill from Connecticut Ag Station is over there collecting uh, leachate data at uh, not just our site, like not just our garden at multiple sites, but it's fun to be a part of that, to to be like a part of that research. And then on, on campus, just a, a lot of different stuff going on. I mean, my role specifically is funded through the School of Business, which might not be might be confusing at first, but having faculty in that department who are interested in sustainability uh, is awesome. So we had two marketing faculty and one student helping us with data and marketing of our two free cycle hubs on campus. So we have stores, but nothing is sold. It's all free. One is geared towards faculty and staff and the other is for students. So the inventory of each one will be slightly different. One is more, one is like dorm supplies and stuff like that. The faculty staff one is, is like ink toner and things like that. But yeah, just having that student really help us with our data analysis, help us with the marketing and communication around that. And that was part of their curriculum. So that's nice to just have those two things linked like that. Uh, another good one, I guess residence life and and the food pantry on campus. We our office organizes a like non-perishable food drive at the end of every semester, which is a like pretty complex and and chaotic during move out. But we managed to get this last semester. I just looked it up. We had fif- about fifteen hundred pounds of non-perishable food, which is which is awesome. And we kept that on campus at our food pantry. And a, a similar line, I'm thinking about our food recovery program. And just having that cooperation and engagement from Sodexo is what makes that possible. So we they are a stakeholder in that. And, that, you know, that's a private business. They have their own vested interest. But it's awesome to have them just involved helping make that possible. And that's another one to throw a good number out there is it started in 2016. And we're at, as of this last year, 2023, we hit over 80,000 pounds of, of food recovered, which is awesome. So last year alone, we, we hit 8,000. And that's great. That's That all stays in New Haven. That, that food all stays in this community. Yeah, cool. that's wonderful. Thank you, Derek. Yeah, sounds like there's a lot of really unique um, collaborations, both within the university and also externally with um, so many amazing groups um, in the New Haven area and also businesses, as you mentioned. Um, yeah, and Dylan, I would like to call on you next because I know there are several um, wonderful, really engaged and active social justice clubs at UConn. Um, yeah, if you if you wanted to speak on that and how your clubs have interacted with them. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. I mean, it's 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 a very important point and something that I always stress on when I'm talking about activism is how intersectional it is and how intersectional it has to be for it to really succeed. Yeah, and uh, I started working in environmental activism and we came together to put together the fossil fuel for yukon coalition that was in 2022 and that was an effort to pr- really try and bring together all of the different environmental groups uh and stakeholders like faculty clubs and anyone else who, who would want to be involved in our community and in, in environmental activism and through that i got to know some really amazing folks um but beyond that i i i've also sort of we've tried to bridge some gaps through other uh, excuse me, other activism going on on campus, because we see that, you know, all these social justice struggles, they're, they're very interconnected and we're all trying to hold accountable the same group of people. Usually it's the Board of Trustees or um, the UConn Foundation at UConn. So we had a really big conscious effort this past year to put together those voices. So we had um, a disorientation, which is an event kind of like orientation, but try to get together the uh, the facts that the administration doesn't exactly want to tell you. Um, so we collaborated with the NAACP chapter, uh, the Revolution Against Rape, which is a um, uh, activism group focusing on sexual assault, sexual abuse on UConn campus, which is a pretty big issue and one that was brought to light very vocally in 2021, I believe, uh, as well as... Uh, some leftist groups who are trying to, to divest Yukon's investments from, you know, different wars and uh, generally the military industrial complex. And this past year, 
Uh, we've been very involved with uh, divestment from what's going on in Gaza right now. And, and that was a really incredible experience to swell up the activism uh, at UConn. And I haven't seen that before. Yeah, thank you, Dylan. Yeah, that sounds really yeah. wonderful that there's a lot of great um, feeding into each other's like activism movements and um, strengthening these larger campaigns throughout UConn. Mm-hmm. And lastly, Amelia, I would love to call on you. Um, and also, yeah, I don't know that much about Texas Sustainability Club, so I'm excited to hear more about how everything has been going on your campus and also even outside of that with Sunrise Movement Connecticut, um, any cross-group collaborations that you can recall from there. Yeah, so the Texas Sustainability Club has worked a lot with the Faculty Sustainability Committee um, that's on campus. So they're the ones that have a lot of the funding so we tend to work with them a lot and kind of our projects oftentimes overlap a lot but we've also worked uh, worked with citizens climate lobby and a bunch of the officers actually went to dc last year for their climate conference um, and we've also co-hosted senator lopes um, and had like kind of a conversations and coffee hour with him with ccl oh uh sorry with cclcv And we've also worked with other local orgs, um, including Sunrise Connecticut, of course, and like the Sierra Club and Save the Sound. And there's also a local nature preserve in Bristol, which is right down the road from Tunxis. So we've worked with them and done like trail cleanups during the semester um, and that sort of thing, too. Awesome. Thanks so much, Amelia. It's really cool to see you working with all the different groups. Um, it was funny you said the Citizens Climate Lobby because I know that Derek's really involved in that. And so that kind of brings us to our next question that I wanted to discuss that with. And so we wanted to recognize that multi-year campaigns like school divestment from fossil fuels can feel pretty defeating. Uh, and we were wondering what keeps your morale up in the face of institutional barriers to climate action? So I guess for Derek, I was kind of curious um, with your involvement with like the Citizens climate lobby and even it could be other experiences working with obviously the different New Haven organizations and businesses you mentioned. Um, I'm curious what kind of barriers barriers you've experienced and like how you've uh, kept your morale basically because sometimes it can feel pretty daunting um, to advocate for environmental change, um, especially when not everyone is is as receptive to, uh, to your activist suggestions, I guess, as you might be. Good question. Just because we're on the theme of Citizens Climate Lobby. One awesome feeling or inspiring or motivating one is going down to DC with that group. Uh, And it's a national group. I'm involved in the local chapter uh, and just seeing just thousands of people lobbying on the steps of Congress for the same, same thing. And just that remembering that you're not alone, that other people are trying, like we have overlapping values. We have overlapping goals. You have conservatives there with, with liberals, like just that team aspect is really helpful, I think. And I guess another tied into that would be, I, I always try to make sure we get photos at our events and that we're tracking data so that we can reflect on wins, even if they're small, just so we can document and keep track of successes. And just to remind us that like in the in the bigger picture, it might feel daunting, but we're taking small steps forward is is better than not doing anything. And also on that, I think I've enjoyed, and I think, our team of interns in the office also seem to enjoy every time we try to take field trips or something or go visit other orgs or sites, whether it's uh, a group maintaining a park. Like we just went to Faulkner's Island with U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Just these trips to to kind of key into what other orgs or people are doing. And again, it ties into that. I think trying to combat that loneliness or solitude and realizing that lots of people are doing good work and putting in a lot of work to try and achieve conservation goals, decarbonization goals. Awesome. Thanks so much. I know you mentioned like taking photos. I think that's such a cool idea. I know like I'm a big fan of like using social media to like um, help expose more people to environmental activism. So I think that's like a perfect way um, to not only remember yourself, like remind yourself why you're doing everything and that there's other people supporting you, um, but also to just raise general awareness, I think is super cool for it's a really great opportunity. Definitely. Okay, I guess for for Dylan, this is uh, definitely a struggle at UConn. As a fellow UConn student, I know everyone at Fossil Fuel for UConn, you guys work so hard um, advocating for divestment um, and for um, institutional change. So I'm kind of curious what your experiences have been trying to keep morale up. Yeah, it's it's a great question. And 
Yeah, to be honest, I mean, it can be really hard sometimes. I mean, there's there's points where you feel like, why am I doing this? There's no point in doing this at all. But I think I have a very similar answer to, to Derek in that um, it's really the other people who get you to to push through and the community around you. Because, I mean, if you give it your all and you don't see any results, you can see side by side uh, other people also really giving it their all. And you just have to keep trying. I mean, personally, what keeps me going is... Um, is I have to try my best for this because I know it's uh, it's really important. It's something that uh, it has to happen. And if there's no one else fighting, then uh, it's not going to happen. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's the community. It's 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 the urgency of the issue that keeps you going. You know, if I didn't have to be in this fight, I, I wouldn't be. Um, but I feel like it's something that it, it really necessitates action. And uh, and yeah, I, I, I would say definitely community is what keeps me going because without the incredible people, yourself included, Jackie and Amelia, I've actually met Amelia uh, at a few times uh, at the uh, at the Capitol as well. It's, it's people like uh, you and uh, Adrian, Derek. Now, I haven't been involved in activism directly with y'all, but I, it's really happy to see you talk about it here. So I'll say the fantastic people. Yeah, definitely. I I was just thinking about how you were talking about, obviously, all like the clubs on campus you guys work with. And so that like even strengthens the community because there's more people working together um, to help address these issues, which is really awesome. But uh, yeah, thanks so much. Uh, Amelia, I guess, how you kept your morale up, you could talk about. I'm kind of curious if there were any there. I'm sure there were barriers to helping create the sustainability club or even in your efforts um, in the past legislative session as an intern. Uh, I'm curious how you kept your morale up in a lot of those different situations where I'm sure there's um, a lot of difficulties um, uh, getting towards um, envir environmental activist goals. Yeah, um, I think very similar to everybody else, honestly. Um, but just the biggest thing that always gives me hope is how many people are working on these issues and also the community that I have like found through environmental work but I think also like especially for a community college being able to look at like four-year schools and universities and seeing the different accomplishments that they've had and I think definitely the biggest barrier is usually a financial barrier especially like at state schools that don't get a lot of funding anymore and it can also be just challenging honestly just to find the people power sometimes, especially at community college, a lot of people have a lot of other responsibilities. They're working, they have families. So it can be hard to find the time to join clubs like the Sustainability Club. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thank you. And it was great to hear from each of you all the different barriers potentially that you're facing, but also uh, really keeping it light with yeah, what keeps your morale up. So thank you all for that. And um, we're wondering, within your activism, what kinds of campaigns or initiatives have you been involved in? And also, if there's something particularly that you're most proud of, um, are there any successes um, that you've made uh, happen that you're particularly excited to share with us about? Um, so yeah, feel free to, to share however many um, you would want to, or just precisely what you're most proud of. Sure, sure. I, I started thinking immediately about projects rather than uh, activism uh, and just like programming because I've been doing a lot of that at uh, Southern. And like tangibly, physically, I, I the garden, I think the campus community garden, I've spent so many hours out there. That it's really just awesome to see it like, transform, evolve and keep growing as we keep we keep like expanding it and taking up a little bit more space around it. Um, yeah, if you haven't ever been there, it's at the corner. It's kind of near Cherry M Park. Uh, it's at like the Hamden line of our campus. It's kind of tucked behind Davis Hall, but it's a really nice open like hillside. Uh, and I'm hoping we can get even more space for us there. But then we have to find someone to manage it. But other than that, I, I mentioned Faulkner's Island. That was really cool. That was like a fun thing to be a part of. It's not open to the public anymore. Uh, once per year, they do like a, a public day, but you have to sign up. It's limited, but that's just something nice to to be involved in. I think I also, I talked about Beaver Brook too. That was a good one just because I like to see so many different orgs teaming up on something so close to our campus and just like a space that students or faculty or staff or SCSU affiliate might not ever go explore or stumble upon or go even look at, but it's really right there. So I, I enjoyed working on that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I definitely um, a garden is, is something to be really proud of. That's that's really exciting to walk by and see something tangible that you worked on that's going to continue to to grow and um, have different students and staff and everyone maintain it throughout, um, hopefully for decades to come at Southern. Yeah. And Dylan, would you like to talk next about um, potentially from the clubs you're part of, campaigns or activities that you're particularly proud of? 
Yeah, I'd love to. I think I'd look back to the past year for the time that I'm, I'm most proud of and, and what we've accomplished and the campaigns with that we've run with. That would be my, my junior year. And that's when I really started to take up with more of a leadership role in, in activism. So in the fall semester, we had a really robust campaign for fossil fuel for Yukon. We really pushed our ourselves. Um, we spoke at every single board of trustees meeting. Uh, we uh, had a walkout for people to to come to that meeting and we, we filled the room and we made our demands clear about divestment from the fossil fuel industry, uh, from the, uh, the Yukon Foundation, which is technically separate from the, uh, the school itself. I don't have much say over it, but it's also the decarbonization of the campus. Right now, there's a natural gas uh, cogeneration plant that provides the heat and power for the university and there's no plan to uh, transition to, to, to green energy. Um, one thing that we did actually accomplish was the Board of Trustees committing to the 2040 net or zero carbon goal. Uh, that's a great win for us. That happened uh, in the fall semester, but uh, we're still really looking for the uh, actual tangible change and the plan that would take us there. So there's still a lot of work to be done. And then I think on the divestment from this last semester and the spring semester, a lot of the folks in environmental activism got really involved in Yukon Divest, which is a coalition put together to divest from the war crimes happening in uh, Gaza right now. We we put together some great demands and there was even an encampment at, at the at Yukon campus that brought a lot of attention to the issue. Um, and it's really spurred a lot of engagement from faculty that we haven't seen before. The University Senate is also very aware and, and supportive of Yukon or students' voices in a way that we haven't seen before. And uh yeah, there's been a lot of movement on divestment that hasn't hasn't even been imaginable imaginable in the past. So I'm very proud of the work that the folks that that put that, that together did. And and yeah, I, I mean I'm just I'm proud of a lot of the folks, but there's a lot of work to be to still be done. Hey, there's always going to be it's always an uphill battle. Yeah, thank you. That's a great way to put it from an activist perspective as well. You know, acknowledging all the great work that has been done, but of course, um, pushing for more in the future. So and yeah, that's that's very exciting that you you're seeing a lot of movement on that recently. Um, and hopefully we can sustain that energy and continue um, all this action in the school year to come. All right. Yeah. And Amelia, uh, I would love to ask you about this question as well, either from your experience with Tungsten Sustainability Club or with CCL or with um, your legislature internship or with Sunrise. Yeah, we'd, we'd love to hear about um, initiatives or campaigns um, you're proud of. <clears throat> the Tungsten Sustainability Club, our biggest initiative and I guess accomplishment was establishing a clothing swap on campus. Did that last year. And it's free for students and faculty to donate and take used clothing. That was a really huge success. And then we've also been working to get composting on campus, specifically in the cafeteria. So this has been kind of an ongoing (laughs) battle in a way. So we got some composting during the fall semester where we collected like pumpkins and other um, natural decorations to be composted. But it looks like this year we will hopefully be able to get composting on campus for like food scraps and food waste, um, which would be super exciting. And then I think with Sunrise, the biggest accomplishment would really be passing the climate change education bill, which was passed in 2023. And that bill just requires that all public K through 12 schools teach climate change as part of the science curriculum. And so I think that's really a huge win um, in the legislature. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I'm sure that'll have a huge impact going forward. And it's really important to have that written in legislature. So that's um, great to hear that you were involved in that really important campaign that'll have effects um, for our public school students statewide. We'll return to our program in just a moment. You've been listening to The Impact, a sustainable CT podcast. While you're surfing the web, don't forget to follow us on Facebook for some fun and interesting stuff. Guaranteed safe for children and pets. Come on, be our friend, won't you? At facebook.com slash sustainable CT. And we, like millions of others, have hopped on the Instagram threads bandwagon at instagram.com slash sustainable CT and threads.net slash at sustainable CT. And yes, of course, we're LinkedIn. Search for Sustainable CT from your LinkedIn page and you'll find us right there being all LinkedIn and media social. 
And if you're not yet a subscriber to Actions and Impact, the Sustainable CT newsletter, you could be missing out on some very important information to you, your organization, and your town. So accept no substitutes, do yourself a favor, and subscribe today. And you can do that where? At sustainablect.org, of course. Yeah, so Derek, I'm kind of curious um, if you're uh, how your work at Southern impacted um, you um, entering into working with like different organizations, whether it's like lobbying and even just your general career goals and kind of what you want to do in sustainability. Yeah, so I have really enjoyed working for the university and being in the higher ed realm. It's just a nice like, nexus of knowledge and and energy. And I, I worked at an interim position at School of the Environment also. And the same thing, I really, I, I really enjoyed being there uh, and just being involved in that. So in terms of career goal, I think that it's helped me be wary of funding, <laughs> of like funding hiccups and starting that nonprofit, that research work. We're running into a problem with with money and everyone is volunteering their uh, and it's a big just sand in the gears and and money seems to be this common theme. That's definitely changed my perspective on how to accomplish something, whether that be change at the federal level, like we've been talking with Citizens Climate Lobby and that group is working at federal policy or change at the local level and just kind of reevaluating the best way to do that and not necessarily re reinventing the wheel. If you have an organization that's already focused on something, it might be best to just join them or work with them instead of trying to, you know, start my own nonprofit and struggle with having no money. <laughs> but on that subject too, I really enjoyed, I took a class um, about innovation, uh, product innovation and tying this into environmental benefit and pitching a business that had an environmental like agenda to it. And recently I've been volunteering and over at Climate Haven a lot and just seeing this connection between business and environment and business and sustainability and and seeing just if anyone hasn't been over there, just going over there and seeing the types of cool stuff people are coming up with. And it's not all tech. It's not all like it's not all uh, AI. The, people are creating a covered bicycle like for the rain and someone is making the inside of surfboards out of fungi, like just cool stuff like that. But yeah, really, I mean, that role really got me involved in other orgs in New Haven. Like we said, there was just so much stuff going on here. It was really easy to jump on a team and and just see what they're doing and be involved in that. Yeah, just like collaboration and combining efforts. And I just saw value and if you're trying to make change or, or, or accomplish something, I just really saw the value in collaboration and working together with other either orgs, or we could scale it down like groups or clubs at a, at a university, whatever the scale of that is, that collaboration piece. Yeah, definitely. Just out of curiosity, just generally being involved at Southern and attending Southern, was that what like made you realize you want to like work in like higher ed sustainability? I'm just kind of curious because obviously you're very involved um, outside of uh, Southern. Mm -hmm. um, but I was curious if, you know, working in campus sustainability made you realize that that's like a career you want to like, you want to stay in. Mm. I definitely have enjoyed it because it's almost like a little city, you know what I mean? The campus is like a little town almost. And there's just so much possibility. There's so much room for decarbonization or for things like campus community gardens. But yeah, I think working at Southern was just maybe not the sole reason, but it really just opened my eyes to possibilities. I think it just introduced me to a lot of different themes, like whether that was actual organizations or something or seeing how the university interacts with the city and this, not to ramble too much, but, you know, we have about five universities in a really small radius here. And I recently have been reaching out to them and trying to arrange meetings, periodic check-ins with the sustainability folks at each university to varying success. Like it's really hard to schedule that many different unaffiliated people has been pretty tough, but just, yeah, I just really got to see the possibilities that could happen at the university scale especially once you combine it with with the city that it's a part of or a neighborhood that it's a part of it's 
cool, obviously, because we're all like at universities to see the amount of like power universities have um, to help make change. Uh, it's so obviously that's such a, an ideal career path because there's so many opportunities um, to further um, activist uh, goals at these uh, universities. But yeah, thanks so much. So uh, Dylan, I'm kind of curious, obviously, since you're, you're a senior, it's getting towards your, your, career, your career. So I'm kind of curious um, how your how your work at UConn has impacted, you know, um, what you basically what your career goals are. Yeah. I think it would be too much to, to, to boil down into one answer, but I think my, my involvement in the sustainability at UConn, it's really been instrumental in, in how I view the world and how I, how I view my career path. I think similar to answer to Derek is, is like, I think it's really taught me a lot about affecting change and what kind of power structures exist. I know a lot about how power structures exist in a university, <laughs> but um, I think more generally, just how people operate and how things are um, pressured to be done. My outlook right now is is I want to go to law school and potentially go into environmental law. And I think with what I've been doing at UConn, I think that's going to inform a lot of what I do. I mean, sometimes I feel like an octopus. I'm, I'm like connected to a lot of different uh, maybe disparate parts of environmentalism on UCon- at UConn, but everything informs everything else in a way, personally, but but also structurally how how things operate. So yeah, it, it, it's been a lot, but I'm sure I can expound on that for for a long time. But I'll I'll, I'll take it, I'll keep it at that. No, that definitely makes sense. It's hard to it's hard to articulate definitely, but that's that's really exciting that you're considering um environmental law. But yeah, thanks so much. So Amelia, I'm kind of curious how you, your career goals have been shaped, especially because you've done so many different things. It was yeah, I know we were talking about you you did like a an engineering study abroad. You're very involved in like um, you know, um policy decisions. So I'm kind of curious what you're currently thinking about for career goals and um how your work in campus sustainability has impacted that? Yeah, thank you for that question. I have always wanted to go into some kind of environmental field. I just wasn't really sure if I wanted it to be more like policy work or if I wanted to like do actual research, scientific research. And I think working at Tonks and especially just making connections with a lot of the other professors and like the internship that I did at the Capitol was really helpful to like kind of show me the different options in a way. Um, and like, I think at this point, I would really like to be able to do research, have the knowledge and stuff that the research would give me to like influence policy and that sort of thing. Yeah, Derek, feel free to chime in. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, to add to what Amelia just said, the like scope of what's out there, I think, is an important one to note. Like, being involved at the university, I really just saw like the wide array of sectors and fields that someone could go into. And it's not, you don't just have to go research. You don't have to go be a botanist or something and work in a lab or something. There's just so many careers related to this. It's like such a broad umbrella term, like sustainability. And, you know, we're talking, Dylan's talking about going into law. Like you really, there's just so many, even if, you know, even if we have policy and when bills are getting shut down and, and we have issues with funding and stuff, there really is just so much opportunity. I think that was a point I wanted to get across. Like there's just a lot of jobs out there. There's a lot of need too. And it's not just nonprofit. It's not just research. It's also legal. It's also private business. Yeah, I guess just to add to that quickly, I think that's kind of a big role that like campus clubs can play is just like showing students the different options that there are to get involved in these issues and also the different paths that you can take because, you know, the sustainability club has business majors and accounting majors. And then we have, you know, people who want to go into law and who are biology majors and like there's so many different options and they all are interconnected with sustainability, which is super cool. Thank you. And speaking of that interconnectedness, so if you look at a list of majors that are available today, a lot of college majors relate some way to sustainability or can be related to the environment in a variety of ways. So we're wondering what role do you think higher educations play or should play in promoting interdisciplinary engagement and sustainability, especially acknowledging our current era of climate crisis that we're living in? Or alternatively, um, what role do you think higher ed- in- education institutions play in you know, having a commitment to decarbonization and sustainability since it's now you know, out of fashion to, to not discuss sustainability as like a 
an institution that is, you know, putting out emissions. So yeah, if you had thoughts on either of those, that would be great to hear. So Derek, I would love to start with you as someone who is working for a university. Um, yeah, what role do you think that they play in decarbonization and or facilitating that interconnectedness? I think there's a big opportunity there. I, it's easy to say they should do this and they should do that. And, you know, speaking from someone at a state university, like we've been talking about money already, or at least I have been mentioning money. It you know, it doesn't, it's not just freely available. You have to expect potential cuts and asking a faculty to change their curriculum. Sometimes this, this stuff is is difficult, but I, I think it's, there's ways that we can get around that. It's a communication piece. It's an outreach piece. It's an awareness piece. And it takes a lot of effort, but we've been able to have, like my office, we've gone to do workshops in classes for faculty completely. You wouldn't, think would care about sustainability or we have host them at the garden for a workshop or something. And so, yeah, maybe it's too much to ask them to just change their curriculum, but I think there should be some expectation that, you know, this is clearly a problem and everyone, we all have to acknowledge it at some point, weather keeps getting worse. And it's like, I don't know how much longer you can, people can deny this, but I think there's plenty of room at whatever baby step a faculty or department wants to take to start incorporating these themes and topics into their curriculum if possible, if not just on the side, somehow having their class join us offsite for an event, like making it optional, making it extra credit or an alternative to an assignment. These are ways I've seen faculty do this, embed this into their class without having to do something drastic, like change their curriculum or something. Yeah. And then I, I think this, I also, this question I wanted to talk about not to go back to the money thing, but just having that funding there through our facilities department for those student internships, I think is really important to keeping our programs alive, like our student-led programs, food recovery, that community garden, uh, and the swap shop and Thrifty All, which are those free cycle hubs I was talking about. Uh, Yeah, just having a consistent budget there, knowing that that funding is going to be there to pay student workers that really makes a huge difference in keeping those programs functioning and alive. Uh, and then that just has a ripple effect. It, oops, that has a ripple effect on those programs don't just operate independently. Like I said, food recovery inherently involves Sodexo and our receiving sites. It links our community. I mean, it links our university to the community, wherever those receiving sites are. Yeah, thank you. That's really great to hear about how Southern is investing in student interns that are continuing to lead this important work. Um, and that's a way to to put money behind sustainability. So that's great to hear. And yeah, Dylan, I would love to hear um, your response to this as someone who is very involved in campus decarbonization. Um, yeah, what role do higher education institutions play? I wanted to touch on a point that Derek made there. I mean, I'm a beneficiary of that that kind of funding that that UConn provides. I'm an intern at the Office of Sustainability, and I see firsthand a lot of the great things that our team does, and and uh, as well as funding for other sustainability efforts like uh, community gardens, which is a recent uh, addition that was helped in part through facilities and and the Office of Sustainability. Um, uh, Swap Shop was uh, also part funded through the Office of Sustainability at UConn, so. I'll just throw my support to, to to what you're saying about funding and how important it is to pay attention and, and give uh, give attention to these important things because the will is there, but uh, if there isn't some kind of institutional backing, like through funding, the change uh, might not be able to happen. In terms of uh, of what I think higher education uh, owes to to our current current era of the climate crisis, I think it's a massive. Uh, burden of responsibility. Personally, I think that oftentimes administrations or, or the state might just look at, uh, and especially also I'll say private schools, uh, look at colleges as a money making venture. Whereas I think it really should be uh, a place of knowledge production and and uh, uh, and storage uh, and somewhere that prepares its students for the future. And I think the primary way or the primary thing that will affect. Uh, the futures of students right now is the climate crisis um, and how it's going to impact our lives. Um, so I think it's a huge responsibility for universities to not only inform their students about the the dangers of the climate crisis, um, but also to serve as examples to how we can respond to the climate crisis. And I think that's where decarbonization and uh, divestment from the fossil fuel industry really um, plays into that. Because if you're not um, providing example for uh, the next generation of how to operate sustainably, 
And we're just going to keep going with the status quo. And we've learned that that's not acceptable. We know that we're on a path for destruction. It's possibly could be worse than any predictions uh, that we've come up with at this point. Personally, I'm, I'm very worried about the future. I, I mean, I'm sure you can tell with uh, with what I've been trying to do. Um, and uh, I think also one point to stress on is that it can always get worse than it is. Um, so we shouldn't just be resigned to to what can will inevitably happen. We have a choice in this. Universities have a choice in this. And it's important to show that. And one point of optimism I'll say is uh, recently uh, UConn, I think maybe five years ago, four years ago, uh, instituted a uh, um, a credit that all students have to take is an e-credit, um, uh, an environmental literacy credit uh, for every student. They have to take at least one class uh, regarding environmentalism and uh, environmental literacy. So I think that's one step in the right direction. And it's one that I think could be emulated at other schools. Wow. Yeah, that's wonderful to hear about that um, environmental literacy requirement. That's um, thank you for pointing out that example and also for bringing our minds to the burden that um, our generation, Generation Z and future generations will have to bear with the climate crisis. And yeah, Amelia, I would like to call on you if there's anything you wanted to add. Yeah, I mean, kind of like what Derek was saying, it's definitely a lot harder state schools, especially like the community college system, because we don't receive a lot of funding at all. Um, but I do think, you know, colleges and universities have the responsibility to incorporate sustainability and climate issues into, you know, the curriculum and also to just like have opportunities available for students to work on these issues, whether it's like internships or research or whatever it might be. Yeah, thanks so much, Amelia. Yeah, so time has been flying by a little. So we are now at our last question. Um, so we're going to be reflecting a little bit on what you guys kind of want to leave at your universities um, after you after you either graduated or you're moving to another job. And so what kind of legacy do you hope to leave and how do you want to see your school's commitment to the to environmental change improving? Do you have any advice for college students looking to get involved in activism um, at school or in their community? I think that's two questions there. The, the first one, the legacy thing, I, I already hint, hinted at like the garden that just a lot of physical like labor put into that. And I didn't start that. I, I, my, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants over there. The garden's been around there, but just improving it, putting in time into, into using it as an event space and that, uh, that's really awesome. And then my, my role is, uh, not typical. The office doesn't usually have a university assistant working for it. So hopefully my time there actually can show or justify the need for funding for a role like that. Like it just on paper say like, this is the benefit of having this extra position here. I'm hoping for that. Um, and then the advice for students, there's usually someone, I think, even if there isn't like a club or an office or something apparent uh, sustainability going on is someone's probably doing something in, in that sphere and you might have to hunt, but asking around. And, and then if someone was, I think another good one, I, I stumbled upon trying to if you're having trouble starting or you have lack of resources to start a club or something, I think it can be helpful to be a, be a chapter of a bigger org like like Autobahn or Food Recovery Network. Uh, starting starting a, something fresh might be a little challenging. You might not have the, uh, the people power or the money and like being a chapter might might mitigate that. Yeah, you're good. Thanks so much. I I guess that goes back to when we talked about um, working with the community at your school. So definitely finding that network of people because you're certainly not going to be the only one who's interested in environmental activism. Um, so that's really important to consider and especially utilizing national networks as an opportunity to get involved and work with people across the country who are also uh, really passionate about activism. But yeah, um, uh, Dylan, do you, have, you can answer either question, but do you have any thoughts on um, what kind of legacy you want to leave at UConn or any advice you have for future activists? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is something I think about a lot, especially as I'm entering my senior year. Legacy, I think something that's very important is uh, institutional knowledge that it doesn't leave with uh, every generation of students. A lot of uh, a lot of knowledge leaves and, and we want to make sure that stays uh, on campus. So I hope that uh, a vibrant environmental community I can I can hopefully try and help foster before I go. And then advice for any college students coming in, uh, I would say uh, just throw yourself in, try and find uh, the, an environmental group, 
Um, I'll say uh, I got involved because of Eco Husky, the club I'm now the president of, and I'm very proud of the work that we do there uh, in bringing people into environmentalism. It's an incredible community. People are very kind. Ask the stupid questions. Go to a community meeting. Uh, meet the the people who are already involved. It might be daunting, but just you know, be yourself and try your best. Yeah, thanks so much, Dylan. I definitely agree. Institutional knowledge is very important to pass down. So um, making sure that there's um, other people who are aware of those important things uh, is is a super great legacy to leave. Um, but yeah, um, Amelia, do you have anything to add? Obviously, you've already created a pretty important legacy of creating a whole in- a sustainability club uh, and obviously with all your other work. So anything you want to add and kind of a legacy you want to create um, and also any advice for future activists? Yeah, I think for me, I just recently graduated from Tungsit. So I'm hopeful that the club will continue to thrive and make meaningful change on campus. We have a really strong foundation of members, which is really awesome. So I I think it will be I think it will be good. And I think as far as advice goes, my biggest piece of advice would just to be to find the part and the aspect of sustainability that's the most meaningful to you as an individual. And also, of course, to find a community of people because you really can't do this work alone. Yeah, thank you, everyone. I'm sure you all are leaving or have left a big legacy um, and impact on the universities that you work for and or attend. So thank you all for the work that you do. Thank you guys so much for your time. Hey, nice job, Jackie and, and Adrian. Yeah. Thanks. We hope you've enjoyed today's edition of The Impact, a sustainable CT podcast. As always, this program is recorded, produced, and copyrighted by Sustainable CT. Thank you for your interest. Thank you for your listening. Thank you to our sponsors, the Hampshire Foundation and the Community Foundation for Greater New Haven. Thank you again to our friends Derek Faulkner, Amelia Kearney, and Dylan Steer for everything they've done to support sustainability on their college campuses and beyond. And thanks to everyone for taking local actions that have a statewide impact.